Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on what's new in Amazon Open Search Service. Presenting with me today is Carl Meadows, Director of Product Management at Open Search, Bill Burkett, Senior Manager at Electronic Arts. My name is Mukul Karnik. I'm the General Manager for Open Search at AWS. It's great to see all of you on this Thursday at reInvent. Hope you all have had a great conference and are looking forward to the replay party tonight. We have a lot of content to cover, some exciting demos. I'll begin with talking about the Open Search Open Source project. Then I'll, I'll talk about how to get data into Open Search. Carl will talk about the search and observability use cases. Bill will show us about how they migrated from self-managed uh, Elasticsearch to open search at Electronic Arts. And then finally, I'll talk about the innovations in the Amazon open search service. Before we get into what open, like the Amazon open search service, I wanted to talk about the open search open source project. So the open search open source project was launched in 2021. And since then, we are seeing some incredible growth. Last year, at this time, we were at about 100 million downloads, and now we are at more than 300 million downloads. So the rate of downloads is accelerating, which is great to see. We are also seeing a lot of partners adopt Open Search. Last year, around this time, we had 40 plus partners of the project, and now we are at 70, 70 plus partners. So more partners joining the project, which is great to see. Partners that are ISVs, partners that are solutions providers, and partners who are major cloud providers. So it's, it's great to see a great spectrum of uh, partners. We also have partners such as SAP and Intel who are now co committing code to the open source project. As a result, we now have more than 1,500 committers to the project, and more than half of them are outside AWS. So it's, it's good to see that the project is gaining momentum and has a, has, a has a community that's beyond AWS. We also have open search that now available on major cloud providers. So we have, of course, the native AWS service, which is the Amazon open search service. We have a native service for open search on Oracle, and we have um, open search services on Azure and GCP through our partners, uh, uh, Bonsai and Ivan. So it's available now on all the major cloud providers. Let's look at the Amazon Open Search Service. The Amazon Open Search Service helps you securely and cost effectively manage open search at scale. If you're using open search for search, then you can improve your, the relevance of your search results. If you're using open search for log analytics, you can do that in a cost effective manner. We are, like, the open search is integrated with various AWS services, including the AI ML services. So you, you can use some of those more easily with the Amazon Open Search Service. As a result, we now have tens of thousands of customers using Open Search to process trillions of requests per month and storing hundreds of petabytes of data. So really, you, a lot of customers using Open Search at scale. We have customers like Adobe using Open Search for their e-commerce platform, or we have customers like Zillow who are using Open Search to search for real estate listings. So a large number of customers across different industries are now using Open Search. So what is search about? Search is about efficiently finding data from efficiently finding insights from your data. Prior to the digital age, people still needed to find information from books and other, other kinds of uh, documents. And so they came up with different kinds of indexing and cataloging schemes. So here's a trivia question. When do you think was the first cataloging scheme invented? Any guesses? How about 500 years back? Who all think it was 500 years back? Can I get a show of hands? How about 1,500 years back? How about 2,000 years back? Yeah, it was invented actually in the third century BC by a Greek poet, Callimachus. And since then, a lot of discovery and invention has happened in cataloging and indexing schemes. 
The modern text-based search is based on an inverted index. Um, in open search, we use Lucene. And so a lot of, so search is based on this, uh, this set of invention. With the, with the boom of AI and ML, we are now seeing customers use semantic search and natural language search to do, uh, to do search. We are also starting to see people trying to leverage the best of both worlds, so using text-based search, using natural language search, and trying to combine them. We have some exciting announcements in this space. Uh, Carl has some exi exciting demo as well, so it would be good to go over that. Open search is a really good tool, and, has, and at the heart is a search engine. Given that, it also is very helpful in the log analytics space. We are trying to get insights from your log data. And so, uh, with, like, we have some uh, really good log analytics capabilities and some good innovation in that space as well, which Carl will talk about. Now that we know what open search is all about, let's look at the ecosystem of open search. You have different kinds of documents, log data, transactional data that you need to get into open search. Typically, you'll have a data engineering team or an engineer in a data platform team who's responsible for getting data into open search. And they'll build some kinds of pipeline to get data into open search. Once you get data into open search, if you're using open search for search, you'll have a search engineering team who's responsible for tuning the results um, and making sure that the results are relevant. If you're using open search for log analytics, you have a typically a DevOps engineer or who's looking at dashboards, trying to find what happened and get to root cause. And if you're using open search in a mid or large company, you will have a platform team that's managing the open search clusters for all the different teams. And so you have a lot of different personas who are involved in the open search ecosystem. So let's look at one such persona who's the data engineer. And what are the challenges they face? They are typically looking to build a pipeline to get data into open search. And they'll use some custom tooling. Sometimes they'll use Logstash running on EC2, or sometimes they'll use Lambdas or some streaming services to get data into open search. Getting data into open search can be difficult. You'll have to first figure out how to collect this data. You, you also need to persist this data in S3 because you want to make it durable. Then you want to buffer this data in case uh, the downstream uh, system is not available or there's some impedance mismatch. And finally, you also want to be able to transform that data. This transformation can be removing duplicates or routing this data conditionally to different clusters. So there's different kinds of transformations you want to do. And all of this is difficult. You have to write maybe custom code, and, that, and then may update it each time your uh, log data changes or your documents change. So it can be pretty painful. To address these challenges, in June of this year, we launched the Amazon ingestion service. The Amazon ingestion service takes care of all of this undifferentiated heavy lifting. You simply send your logs or your documents to the endpoint, we also have connectors to S3, Kafka, and different sources. The service, uh, in the service, you can uh, configure uh, different kinds of processors that let you transform the data. And this is through configuration, so you don't have to write code. And then you can send the data into an open search cluster. So it's, it's very easy to use. It scales, and the best part is it is serverless, so it scales up and down with your traffic, so you don't have to worry about scaling, sizing this cluster, it just does it automatically. And the, another uh, important part is that it is actually very efficient. We did some benchmarks compared to Logstash, and it's about 60 to 70% more efficient than Logstash. So it's really efficient and cost-effective way to get data into open search. Let's look at this ingestion service a little bit more in detail. You, there's a concept of sources. These are sources uh, where, uh, to, that connect to different um, uh, transactional systems, or you can put log data in. You'll have different kinds of processors. 
You have processors to do enrich the data, so uh, GOIP processors or processors to remove duplicates or do different kinds of regex patterns. So rich set, of, rich set of processors, and the sync is typically the Amazon Open Set service. We have launched a couple of new capabilities as well. We've launched the ability to buffer data within the ingestion service so you don't have to worry about it. And we've also launched uh, new sources. So now we support Elastic 7.x versions as well as older versions of OpenSearch. What this lets you do is it helps you in migration. So if you have data in older versions of Elasticsearch or OpenSearch and you want to get to the latest version, you can use this ingestion service to re-index that data. Talking about migrations, how many of y'all have had to deal with painful migrations? Can I get a show of hands? That's, that's a few of y'all. Migrations can be challenging. You need to figure out, one, how, what kind of cluster to use, how to size it, how to tune it. Then you need to figure out how to get your data into this new cluster. Typically, you'll do some kind of POC, try to figure out the parameters that you need to tune. And then the migration of the data itself can be challenging. So to help with some of these challenges, I'm excited to announce a migration assistant. This migration assistant is available in the AWS Solutions Library, but is also available as an open source project. So if you want to build on it, or if you're partners who are working with other customers, you can build on it and uh, use the migration assistant. So what does the migration assistant do? The migration assistant deploys an agent in an un unintrusive manner on your existing cluster and helps fork and replicate traffic to a new cluster. And this cluster may be running the latest version that you want to migrate to. What it also lets you do, it lets you compare the results from the old cluster with the results from the new cluster to make sure that the results are showing up in the right order if you're using for search. It also lets you compare the performance. So are you seeing the same performance or not? The nice part is you can control the amount of traffic that goes to the new cluster. So you can go like a few percentage, so 30% of traffic or like 100% of traffic, and you can replicate that. So with this kind of uh, assistant, you now have the ability to really test your new cluster, the performance, the scale, the correctness, and, and migrate in a more confident manner. One of the challenges, one of the other challenges uh, in, uh, that we hear from customers is if you're building applications using something like DynamoDB um, and you want to add search to your application, you need to move data from DynamoDB to something like OpenSearch. And this can be challenging. You have to build, again, a pipeline. Uh, usually what we hear customers do is use Lambda or run this on EC2. Uh, using, again, some streams, and, and it can be challenging. What, so just yesterday, we announced the zero ETL integration with DynamoDB so that you can synchronize your DynamoDB table with your open search index. The nice part is this integration is available in the Dynamo console, so as soon as you create your table there, you can go and set the index that you want to uh, use for open search. And the ingestion service uh, that I just talked about does all the heavy lifting for you. So it's a very easy way to get data in, from DynamoDB into OpenSearch and keep it up to date. Looking back at sort of the life of a data engineer, uh, dealing with trying to get data into OpenSearch, hopefully with all of these innovations, the ingestion service, as well as the zero ETL integration with DynamoDB, it, it's, it's become a little easier so that you don't have to worry about some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now to talk about the search and the observability use cases, I'm happy to invite Carl. Awesome. So yeah, I get to talk about search. I'm Carl, again. The, uh, 
how many people here have had the responsibility of managing search on a platform? A lot. So, you know, traditionally with, you know, managing search, my job is to make sure that I get the most relevant data that from, based off the customer prompt to solve that I think best meets my business objectives. So to do that, I often have to fine tune search. I often have to um, set up boosting results, deal with synonym files to make sure I'm getting good results. So as McCool mentioned, open search at its heart is a relevancy engine. It's designed to make sure that we're getting the best results back to meet the customer inquiry. It's um, also got other features that just come out of the box with open search. On top of text search, you have other techniques like faceting, which allows you to group and filter by category, as well as geospatial capabilities. So say I wanted to limit that search to within five miles of the requester's location, or autocomplete, or fuzzy search. These are all capabilities that come out of the box with open search. And now, you know, with these new techniques for AI and ML, we're integrating those capabilities into OpenSearch 2 so you have a full toolbox available to you to deliver the best results to your customer. So this would be your traditional tech search. Uh, Amazon.com actually does run a quite a bit of ML in theirs today, but if you look at your traditional tech search, you've got a catalog of data and the search terms that are coming in are designed to best match the, uh, the customer's intent. And how it does that is it scores each, and the highest score is the more relevant, and that is the rank that they're going to, to be presented. And you can do things like fa faceting to drill down. Now, who here has heard uh, there's this Gen AI thing? Have any talk about that in any of the sessions you've been at? <laughs> so. AI and ML has made huge leaps in the last, you know, most notably in the last year, to have these models really deeply understand the English language and be able to better understand potentially intent than what you could get from a text prompt. And we're gonna go demo, I'm gonna show a couple examples of this in a minute. And so this is a really powerful functionality for search. We wanna make sure that that is fully capable of being used with search. So how, do ML, how does AI and ML actually understand the language? And how does that actually work in practice? So it does so by basically taking, uh, converting things into vectors. You might have heard of vectors is basically a row with dimensions are numbers. So a m common model might have 1,000 dimensions or 1,500 or even 4,000 dimensions on any particular data. Those dimensions make up the model's understanding of that document. And when you search, you're actually searching for the closest match in that massively dimensional space to get back the most relevant objects that are closest in that dimensional space to the, the request. And so that's how a model speaks. How this process tends to work or does work is that you, in the most simplest form, you've got a set of documents. So this could be images, it could be audio, it could be logs, it could be rich text documents. You feed those into a model. The model then converts those into vectors. Those vectors can be stored in a vector database, Amazon Open Search Service, and the vector engine that we offer on serverless are, is a very popular engine for storing vectors. Then, if you think about the world's simplest chat flow, you would have a, a, a you know, experience where you know, a user may ask a question. That question goes to the LLM. The LLM converts that question into a vector and then returns back, sends that to Open Search, which is going to send back a set of results, which it then converts back into a human language that sends back to the person. Now, Gen AI applications are actually much more complicated than this in practice. In most real world scenarios, to build a really nice experience for customers, it's not quite as simple as just 
question and answer with the model. You usually want to have multiple stages of analysis. You might have some reasoning, chain of reasoning that you need to do. And to do that, you tend to have to build an application middleware. You know, these can often be done with like Langchain or Llama Index or Haystack, which is going to walk through that workflow. And each step of that workflow may be interacting with one or many models that are, you know, interacting with one or many vector databases. But that's a lot of work to build those, to build that middleware. So I'm excited to talk about, we launched open, uh, open search neural search with 2.9. And the goal of open neural search is to make, reduce that amount of middleware that you have to build, and also give you local and native access to all of the other capabilities of open search in the same pipeline. So how neural search works is you can have your applications using the open search APIs that they're familiar with, talking and communicating with open search. Inside OpenSearch, we've decomposed the indexing pipeline and the search pipeline so that while that document comes, say that application sent a document in, that document can just come into OpenSearch. You can have an, an inside the ingest pipeline, say it was an image, it could then send that out to a model to create the embeddings and it would store the embeddings alongside the rest of the metadata associated with that object or other search information you have with that object. Same goes for the search. Like if an application sends a search, the search pipeline could have multiple stages in it. So the search pipeline could have one stage where it's doing a lexical search and then the semantic search can come back from a model, it can compare those results, do a composite score. It could also call out to another model to do personalization, to then rank those based off of the, per the, the user. And then it could actually call out to another model, say, to take those results and summarize them. And all of that could be done without having to go and build middleware and could be done strictly from open search and returned back as an open search API. This also has the benefit of making it much easier to test out new things. I mean, part of what's happening is there's new models all the time. And so having a stable application stack that you can work with and then having the ability to experiment and try new things easily is you know, one of the things that we want to do for you. We want to make it easy for you to build and do things that we haven't thought of. So, on top of neural search, we've been able to add several features so far this year. So we added hybrid search, which allows you to combine text, textual analysis and all those capabilities of open search with the vector similarity search and with composite scoring the ability to run your own fine-tuned models on SageMaker and have a no-code integration with the open, manage, Amazon OpenSearch service managed clusters. So you could run your own model um, and call out to it through neural search. We also, with 2.11, which was just announced a few weeks ago, added a new type of uh, search technique called sparse vector retrieval. So what I described earlier with the vector search was actually dense vectors. It was a, a vector with thousands of dimensions. Sparse vector is a splayed model, is a slimmer model where you are doing fewer tokens that are more aligned with the properties in the inverted index. And this has shown a lot of promise in our testing with uh, being able to understand that intent without as much heavy cost and as much you know, to go out to a very large model. You can run a much smaller model and you can get performance more closer to on par to what a lexical could perform because the model's much lighter. So we're really excited about sparse vector retrieval. And then Swami in his keynote showed an example of multimodal search. It was actually an open search uh, uh, screen in the back. I would have loved him to say that. <laughs> but the sparse, the multimodal search, oftentimes these models, if you like, multimodal is combining image and text. So you could send the image into the multimodal model. It'll encode in those embeddings what it thinks is in that image without you having to label the data or do anything like that. And I'm gonna show a demo of that too, which can sometimes offer like really amazing results. We've also added uh, 
into the managed service, the ability to in integrate these make it much easier. So we add an integrations tab to where there's CloudFormation templates right there that will you know, spin up with uh, Bedrock Titan text embeddings. The sparse model is wired up there. We're gonna add others, Cohere and other of our partners, just to make it easy to spin these up without having to do as much manual work. All right, so I'll jump over to a demo real quick. This demo or is on the, the Amazon OpenSearch.org uh, open playground. So you can feel free to go out there and run these experiments yourself. And here we are. So I mentioned this is the search comparison tool, which is a, a tool that's in, in uh, open search dashboards. So anybody can play with this tool. But in this case, we're looking at the Amazon products corpus we loaded into this playground. And on the left, I'm doing just a standard text analysis, untuned BM25 lexical analysis. And on the right, we're using the uh, uh, Titan text embedding model. So if I type in something like shoes. Oh, I should hit refresh before I do this. If I type in something like shoes, you'll see there's not like context there. Like shoes doesn't have any additional context. The model's not gonna be smart enough to tell me anything more interesting than the text analysis would. So they both are showing shoes just fine. However, if I type in something like sailboat shoes, you'll see the text model is showing me shoes and sailboats. <laughs> so unless I had, I had the wherewithal or the thought ahead to create a synonym file that said sailboat shoes equal these brown leather shoe things, <laughs> then this is the results I would get. In the semantic model, it understood sailboat shoes to be brown leather boat shoes. Any, I have not shopped for sailboat shoes, but anyone that has, is that a better result? <laughs> so, and you, the, um, you can see a similar example with this if we say did tennis clothes. The lexical model is giving us bags that uh, have tennis and clothes in the description as a highly ranked result. Whereas the semantic model actually understood our intent was to get clothes for playing tennis. And so has a lot of sporty gear for playing tennis with them. Now, I'm gonna jump to another example. I'll hit refresh just in case I need to. Um, in this one, I have the Titan text embedding model on the left, so the semantic dense vector model on the left. And on the right, I've got the multimodal, uh, the Titan multimodal model that Swami announced uh, on Tuesday. And in this example, I'll search mountain bike. And they'll both do good at mountain bikes. They'll both show us mountain bikes. But if I take this a little further and I say, white mountain bike frame. You'll see the semantic model does show me a white mountain bike frame, but shows me a lot of mountain bikes, shows me a lot of mountain bike parts. The multimodal model actually did great with this. It was able, because it was, when it looked at that picture, it saw that picture was a white mountain bike frame. And so, when I do a search on white mountain bike frame, I actually get really good results because it's able to return white mountain bike frames because the, the model properly interpreted the image. Is that cool? Awesome. <laughs> okay. That turn it off. No, it'll go back to one. Yay. Okay. Um, So with that, I hope for the search, you guys have seen that like the open search team's been busy. Hopefully we've been adding a lot of stuff that you guys are gonna be able to do a lot of powerful things with. 
from their continuing to expand our capabilities on vectors and vector search, as well as the neural search plugin. And uh, building on top of the neural search plugin, composite scoring, hybrid scoring, custom models, sparse vector, and multimodal support. So from there, let's shift over to a very, uh, another extremely popular use case with open search is using it as a machine-generated data analysis tool for like log analytics, observability. And how many people use open search for log analytics and observability use cases? Yeah, a lot, yeah. Um, you know, when you're doing that, open search is a great tool for that because it's got all of those capabilities I talked, to, I talked about. It's distributed, it can handle large streams of data and provide really fast query response, which um, makes it ideal for that. As a developer or DevOps engineer, though I have to learn how to write queries to do my forensic analysis. I have to create dashboards for my data set. I have to configure low alerts. Um, I have to make, manually correlate across things if I don't have a common schema to, in order to identify the right uh, how I, issues are related across data sources. And if I was doing security analytics, I'd have to build uh, a lot of tools across the top to be able to do security insights using open search. So uh, is anyone here has had to carry a pager and been responsible in the middle of the night for fixing a problem, having good tools matters a lot. You know, the more downtime creates stress, um, and so you need tools that allow you to help you quickly identify problems, quickly do forensic analysis and determine root cause so you can get back to sleep or get back to your family. So to help with this, uh, a, few, a few years ago we launched the observability capabilities into OpenSearch to layer on some of these capabilities to make it even faster and easier. So we added built-in anomaly detection and alerts we have rich support for open telemetry data, which allows you to do tracing and see spans and service maps to identify and pinpoint in complex environments the source of problems, and then be able to correlate that with your logs and with your metrics, adding features like log patterns, tailing, surround. We also created a language called PPL, which is a piped processing language which is really optimal for doing data discovery and exploration, it's piped. So I can start with this, sort by that, group by this, and it's very logical in its flow. It's much easier for doing this type of data exploration than say SQL would be, or OpenSearch DSL. We've also then now extended it. Jaeger is another very popular tracing format and built full visualization capabilities for Jaeger, uh, including spans, trace groups, service maps and added automated ability to extract metrics out of logs that are correlated with the rest of the system. So, I'm gonna play, did we plug in audio? We did not, but I'm doing it now. Oh, it's on this one, I'm sorry. Is there sound? Yeah. I, uh, can you, there you go. Nope. <laughs> we should have tested this. Maybe it's me. Let's try that. Try now. From your data. We're excited to introduce the Open Search Assistant Toolkit to help developers build generative AI experiences to solve search and analytics problems. With the Open Search Assistant, you can build solutions that let you write queries using natural language, such as, are there any errors in my logs? Or if you want to quickly see your data in action, try asking the Open Search Assistant to create a visualization. The Open Search Assistant unlocks a new world of possibilities for building powerful generative AI experiences and discovering rich insights from your data. Start building with the Open Search Assistant today. Cool. Apologies for the glitch.
but mm, back. There we go. Cool. So with the open search assistant, I remember I mentioned sometimes you know you have to be able to write a query and it's late at night and you want to be able to quickly find an information. The open source open search toolkit assistant. Right now we're releasing it in open source. We're going to build it into the service to make it available to all of you next year. But you can, this assistant will, you, you can use natural language to help you write those queries. And then once you write the query and run it, it will automatically then take and summarize that data to help you provide, easily get insights into that. And that's just the beginning. We're going to be implementing more and more skills into the assistant so you could do things like create a visualization for me, create a pie chart of this data uh, with this filter, or create an alert for me at this threshold. And those skills will all be built into the system to make it much easier and faster to use the service to help you solve problems more quickly. So this is all open source. Nope, wrong one. There. And you can, I mentioned the playground earlier. This is available at the observability.playground.opensearch.org. You can uh, log in, experiment with asking it questions with the data that's loaded in there and the summarization. It's pretty cool. I think you'll be excited about it. And um, like I said, it's all open source so that uh, you, you know, others that are using open search can customize it and do, do things with their own skills. Right now it's wired up on our side with all of our own prompts and our own uh, reasoning logic using uh, Anthropic Claude in the back end. Cool? Awesome. So the, I also, earlier this year, I mentioned that doing security analytics is often quite a bit of work to try to use open search for security analytics. And part of this is, when you're doing observability and monitoring, you're typically looking at aggregations. You're like, is my error rate exceeded Y over the last five minutes? And that's what's triggering events. Security, you have to look at every log line. And you have to analyze every log line against a, a threat database. And so earlier this year, we launched Security Analytics, which builds in a, a, alerting in, uh, a rules engine that look, can analyze against your own custom rules as well as 2,200 Sigma rules we added, every log line as they're ingested. And then it'll detect if there's issues. And we also built a correlation engine on top of that so that it can closely correlate if this threat on this host is also associated with this requester who also talked to this host now all that correlation, it builds an inbuilt graph automatically to help you trace and identify how threats could potentially be related out of the box with no manual configuration. So I'd be very excited for folks to take a look at this. There's a lot of, I think, power that can be derived from uh, security analytics. Now, this one I'm particularly excited about. Oftentimes, we have a lot of data, open search is amazing, like I said, for really fast analysis of data that we frequently use to troubleshoot and monitor our environments. However, there's often a larger pool of data out there that is just not economically feasible to load into open search. We don't query it that much, but there's valuable insights in that data. So uh, yesterday, Swami announced the zero ETL integration with Amazon S3. And what it does is it allows us to query that data in place without all of the expense of indexing it into open search. And it also has capabilities to do secondary indices automatically to accelerate those queries, build materialized views in open search so you can get fast views of your data, as well as selectively index data. So how does this work? So like I said, today you've got Amazon Open Search Service. It's got a bunch of your primary data in there. It's got your infrastructure logs, your app logs, and that's stuff that you're looking at constantly and you need fast access to. It, using the tables defined in AWS Glue, which it'll help you do as well, you may, out in S3, you may have secondary data 
like VPC flow logs or WAF logs that can be enormous in size. But, they, like I said, they sometimes can have really valuable information when you're trying to do forensics or troubleshooting. And what it allows you to query that data directly, as well as configure acceleration so that you can define skip indexes so it knows what partitions to skip to allow faster, faster performance, build materialized views. So if I want to summarize that data for a dashboard and keep it refreshed, it can do, it do that as a secondary indice as well as covering indexes, which would be, I actually want to copy maybe all the data in this column into OpenSearch for further analysis. So with that, let me actually show you that it's real so you believe me. <laughs> Let's go back to two. All right, up there. All right, so if I go into my data, there, there's a data sources object uh, tab here. If I see in my data sources, if I click it, I now see that I have the zero ETL connection. Oops. If I click on that, this is the actual bucket Gluc data catalog object that I've registered, and I have several options there. I can build accelerations, I can build an integration, which I'll show you an integration example, or I can query it directly. So I'll just go show you that it actually works. I'm gonna go over into Discover, a regular Discover tab, and we'll see I've got my regular open search data, but I also now have Amazon S3 as an option. If I click on that, I could run a SQL or PPL query. I'm gonna go ahead and run a SQL query. This is VPC flow log data, and I'm just running a quick query to show me the top 10 source by bytes in that data set. I just wrote a quick SQL query. And it's actually now, none of this data is indexed. It's actually going out to S3 to scan that data to come back with the results. So it's not gonna be quite as fast as OpenSearch because the data is not indexed. But hopefully by the time I'm done dancing, it'll be done. <laughs> So we can see that data is now available to the, uh, using the same you know, OpenSearch SQL or OpenSearch PPL, the same tools I was using, and none of that data was indexed. So I have, from the same place that I'm looking at my other logs, I can quickly do analysis. I mentioned the integration. So these data sources we've shipped with a set of integrations to make it easier to get them set up. So, there was a VPC flow log integration, which I used, which automatically built visualization and materialized views for me. So now if I go into my dashboards, this is my dashboard for my VPC flow logs of the data in S3. Uh, it's being powered by the materialized view that the integration created, which is doing scans to get updated information and build just the summary information in OpenSearch. And I can see in this dashboard, you know, out of the box I could do things like say, only show me the rejects, and I get the same OpenSearch-like performance to redraw that dashboard because that summary data is available locally as an index in OpenSearch and then one of those secondary indices. Cool? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So with that, hopefully uh, we're doing a good job making that developer and that DevOps user's life better by adding more observability capability, more tools, the open search assistance coming soon, uh, security analytics, as well as the zero ETL integration uh, with S3, which is now in preview, ungated, so anybody can go try it out today and let us know how, it, how it's doing for you. And with that, I will hand it over to Bill Burkett, one of our customers, to talk about his experiences. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Burkett. I'm with the Platform Infrastructure and Engineering uh, Group at Electronic Arts. Uh, have a guy here to help me kick off my presentation. Any FC players out there? Not too many, a few of you, all right, good. 
So what my organization does is provide a lot of services, for example, observability services that power over 100, 180 EA and EA affiliated titles. So one of these services that I want to talk to you guys today about is a uh, formerly Elasticsearch, now open search cluster that we built to give us observability um, for some of the uh, most popular titles that you're familiar with. So for example, we have marketplace services, social services, and matchmaking services that underlie a lot of, uh, a lot of our really common games like your FC24, Madden, Apex Legends, uh, and a whole bunch of other ones. So, you know, I think the gaming industry uh, poses a lot of interesting software development lifecycle challenges. Some of you may be familiar with, and some of them might be a little novel. Uh, some of our titles, for example, Apex Legends, probably have a more familiar observability pattern than you might be uh, used to in some of your live services. Pretty consistent logging output all day, all night, every day. Some of our titles, our sports titles, uh, Madden, FC, NHL, these have very, very heavy development and load testing and release cycles that happen every year. So lots of logging data that's produced uh, at launch time, before launch time, and then really heavily uh, monitored. Some of our titles are more standalone. So they have, again, very heavy load testing cycles, very heavy launch cycles, and then have a natural progression where they tend to decline over time. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other interesting things about uh, the gaming environment is its loads tend to be pretty bursty and somewhat unpredictable. Uh, you may get a viral event or a sporting event that may cause a lot of uh, traffic to suddenly appear that you weren't ready for. Or sometimes there may be a promotion that you were, uh, you were ready for that, um, <clears throat> that had more logging output that you weren't quite ready for. So a concrete example I love to give of this, and it's top of mind because it actually happened while we were doing this migration, is that uh, we had a title, Star Wars Squadrons, one of our more standalone multiplayer titles, uh, was released a couple of years ago. Um, recently, we released it in the Epic Game Store as a free game release. So we knew that promotion was coming, we were somewhat ready for it, but we did not expect how chatty that game was gonna be to our logging cluster. So when that game was released as a free game at 2X the total volume to our logging cluster, we really scrambled to try and uh, scale this logging cluster, and we, we weren't able to keep up. Because this was a single tenant, or sorry, a multi-tenant logging cluster, that affected the ability the visibility and the availability of the observability of uh, several of our other uh, titles. So <clears throat> what I want to talk about is some of the challenges with our leg legacy logging stack and why we decided to move, uh, move to open search. So our, uh, our legacy Elasticsearch stack was uh, pretty difficult to scale. This, this uh, cluster was built manually in uh, Kubernetes. So when I say built manually, we deployed these containers ourselves. We deployed the workload ourselves. We built and packaged this ourselves. It was running as stateful sets in Kubernetes. Uh, we configured, you know, the EBS volumes ourselves. We con configured the size of the EC2 instances ourselves. So a couple of the issues that we had also with this cluster was that it was in an aging Kubernetes cluster. So it was no longer a, a, an EKS cluster that was in support. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that we reached out to when we were talking to the Elasticsearch folks was how can we better manage this ourselves? And their, their guidance was to um, try and move this to the more modern operators. Well, we couldn't move to the more modern Elasticsearch operator because our version of Kubernetes was old, and we couldn't really update our version of Kubernetes because we'd built a lot of custom stuff around the, uh, the Elasticsearch cluster that we had. So we're really stuck between uh, a rock and a hard place. We we're also spending uh, a lot of babysitting and engineering toil with this cluster. For, for this six-person engineering team, we really had between one and two people who are at all times ba basically dedicated to scaling this cluster up and scaling this cluster down. That's actually one of the things I forgot to mention It's pretty unique about uh, gaming is because of these life cycle instances, we don't always just scale up all the time. We actually have to scale clusters down as uh, games have their natural, uh, natural aging life cycle. We want to scale the cluster down so that we be can be cost efficient as possible. Very hard to scale this cluster. One of the things you might see a little later that I show is we were pretty massively over, over provisioned in our existing logging cluster and that was basically to get around some of this toil. You don't have to spend as much time babysitting as if you're just massively over-provisioned. The other challenge that we had with this logging stack 
was uh, the high loss licensing fees. This was something that we were, uh, we were paying to Elastic. And because we self-hosted, we had a limited, limited amount of support as well. We were pretty much on our own. So just real quick, I want to walk through the, uh, the architecture uh, before and after the transition. <laughs> it's gonna be pretty similar, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about why. But you can see, right, some of the titles on the left and some of these common services that we have, matchmaking, uh, marketplace, and social. Uh, DCS is a custom ingestion service uh, that we created ourselves. I think uh, McCool mentioned earlier that ingestion is hard. So uh, we, we did find that and we built a custom component to, to deal with that. Actually it turned out to be a lifesaver later on. But from that point on, it's pretty, pretty typical uh, Elasticsearch slash open search stack that you might be, be pretty familiar with. We're pumping data into Kafka from Kafka to Logstash, Logstash pumping data into Elasticsearch itself. So what do we do after the transition? Well, all we had to do was just change out one little box from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch. Pretty easy, right? Actually, it turned out not to be so difficult because we had this nice architectural decoupling layer with DCS. This allowed us to uh, do some pretty interesting things. So I want to talk about how we used Elasticsearch to solve that problem. So what we actually did, we forked data at that DCS point. This is a common ingestion endpoint that we created and allowed us to write to two places. So we spent a lot of time mirroring this data off to this open search cluster to try and figure out what was the right, uh, right way to get it tuned. What was the right uh, sharding strategy? What were the right instances strategies? Could we leverage ultra warm nodes? Those type of things. So that took, uh, that took a quite a bit of time of trial and error. Also something McCool touched, touched on maybe uh, might, be, might be helped now with the migration service, but this was something that uh, we spent a lot of time on. And we begin to right size the previous cluster. So again, one of the things we realized as we were doing this, that we were pretty, pretty massively over provisioned. We wanted to try, as opposed to just bringing up two clusters and test it, the, it simultaneously, we wanted to try and bring one up and one down. This was to try and be as cost neutral as possible. Again, we wanted to try and be, uh, be, be pretty protective of the, of the game team's money. So in order to reduce the spend, we scaled, as we scaled up, we scaled down. What we did is we took a low, some of our lower throughput tenants, migrated them over. One of the really nice things about OpenSearch was that we didn't have to retrain those customers. Basically, we pointed them at a new URL. The OpenSearch UI was very familiar with the uh, Kibana UI that they were pretty useful before. We wrote some automation that migrated existing dashboards and existing user accounts over to the new system. So after we did a couple of UAT testing scenarios with some of our customers, we decided to move everybody else over. So how we did that was basically just dual write to both clusters simultaneously for two weeks. So really after doing some downsizing and dual writing to the customer, dual writing to both clusters, we really, uh, we really only had to pay for a smaller subset of two clusters simultaneously. So it really helped us save, again, a lot of money there. <coughs> um, Last bullet point I call out here is the ultra warm gnomes. That was really one of the, the key ways that we were able to save money. So, you know, this, this is the slide I think that kind of calls out what's really important, what, what really matters here. So you can see how much this really reduced our costs. I left out some of the absolute values, but I'll say that this is in the seven figures and how much money this actually saved us in our logging cluster. So you can see how we transitioned mostly from a lot of EC2 you see this is called out as EC2, other that's mostly EBS volume spend. One of the things we were using was GP2s. Going to uh, open search allowed us to save a whole bunch of money on those uh, legacy clusters. So overall, we saved a whole bunch of absolute money. The thing that you don't also see here is the TCO, right? The, the reduction in spend in developer time that we spent in, in DevOps time babysitting, scaling, and maintaining this cluster. So we have not had, since we've done this, uh, probably about seven or eight months ago now at this point, we have not had one issue with this cluster. It's not gone down. We have not lost any observability on any of our, uh, on any of our titles, and it's just been pretty rock solid for us. So I want to call out, uh, last slide here, some of the challenges, opportunities, and road ahead, some of the things we want to do, some of the things we had problems with, some of the things you might face, and some of the things that uh, local talked about might be better now. Uh, right sizing the initial cluster I called out, there was a lot of uh, guest check and refine going on there. That took us a long time to figure out what was the right sharding strategy, what were the right instance sizes, how big should we make that cluster. That took quite a bit of time. Uh, migrating users and dashboards at that time was something we had to write ourselves. We built that automation. Uh, scaling today is much faster and easier. Um, we can scale right in under an hour when we see these problems come through, uh, but it's still, uh, 
still something that's not quite automated for us. We get an alert when it's time to scale up, we get an alert when it's time to scale down, but that's still a button somebody goes in basically and pushes today. Something we're looking forward to maybe in the, uh, the serverless options going forward. Uh, monitoring hardware and watching for bottlenecks, that's still an issue. We're not as abstracted from the hardware as we would like to be. You still need to make sure that your, uh, your CPUs are in good shape. That's basically how we scale. We try and keep our CPUs in that happy 50% spot. We're still looking at memory. Still looking at, we're still pretty close to the hardware. So one of the things, again, uh, looking at some of the serverless offerings, we hope we can get away from in the future. And then some of, the, you know, some of the exciting things that we're looking about are le leveraging AI and ML to try and get more proactive about logging instead of um, reactive. So overall, it's been a pretty positive experience for us. We saved a lot of money and uh, we're pretty excited to see what uh, comes next in OpenSearch. Thank you for your time. see uh, the savings that, that you all got from um, you switching to open search. So I got the last five minutes, so I'll walk through some of the innovations on the Amazon open search service. If you are using, if you're part of the platform team and managing open search, that can be challenging. And so we've done a bunch of innovations to improve, uh, improve your life. We have improved operations on several fronts. Uh, we have uh, done more thing, uh, auto-tune, which lets uh, you tune your JVM or other settings based on the workload. We have improved the self-healing capabilities within OpenSearch. So self-healing takes care of uh, no, like a node going down or uh, rotating a certificate. There's a bunch of uh, self-healing uh, capabilities within OpenSearch that we do automatically on your behalf. We've also added some self-service capabilities. So ability to restart or reboot a node is now available in a safe manner, and that can help you get out of an issue quickly if you need to. One of the things we have also introduced is off-peak hours. So that, what that lets you do is you can define a time window where your traffic is the lowest or where it's safe to deploy software, and the automatic updates that we do for security or for other reasons will happen only in that window. So if you are using open search for production, I highly recommend trying to use that particular feature. One of the things, uh, one of the challenges we hear from customers is when the node goes down or when an AZ goes down, you can have issues with open search and it's hard to maintain that 99.99% reliability. So in uh, early this year, we launched multi-AZ with standby that gives you the four nines availability by doing a bunch of innovations, um, by reducing the amount of data, that movement that happens when an AZ goes down or a node goes down, uh, by having a standby um, AZ, which, you can, uh, which we automatically flip over to in case that AZ does go down. Or if a node goes down, we can leverage that standby node to uh, use and serve traffic. And in this way, you don't have any downtime. And if, you're used, if you have a latency-sensitive application or an application that really requires this high availability, you should try it out. Because in the, in the events that we've seen that have happened, uh, uh, we've seen uh, like these clusters perform really well and have no issues. So I highly recommend using Multi-AZ with standby if you want that availability. We also just announced the Open Search Optimized Instance family uh, yesterday. This instance family, uh, this instance type gives you 80% higher throughput and 30% improvement in price performance. So if you are having an index, uh, indexing heavy workload or a write heavy workload, you will see uh, some of these benefits of high throughput and lower cost. So how did we, uh, sorry, one other key benefit which I want to highlight is the high durability. With this instance family, now you can have the durability of S3 because these instances are now backed by S3. So what is the innovation that we did to get this? If you look at Elasticsearch and the older versions of OpenSearch, the way replication works is a document or a log gets indexed into one node and the same document that gets indexed into another node or the replica. And this, so this indexing happens twice. Also, 
the, the data is not backed by any uh, S3 or any of this, uh, any of the cloud uh, uh, sort of uh, storage. As a result, if a node goes down, uh, you now are left with the replica, and uh, so you need to make sure that you have the right amount of replication. With this capability, what we have done is, instead of uh, replicating the documents, we are actually taking the physical segments and pushing them to S3, and then the replicas download that from S3. And that, that gives you an RP of zero in case uh, the node goes down, and you can just uh, get the data back from the node. And it also improves the throughput because you're doing this indexing work only once and you're just downloading the uh, physical sort of segments from S3. So, so it's a pretty powerful uh, instance type, uh, giving you a lot of um, throughput and at a lower cost. We've also launched uh, serverless early this year. Um, serverless lets you scale up and down uh, based on your traffic and you don't have to worry about sharding, you don't have to worry about deciding the nodes. Uh, all you need to do is send data to the serverless endpoint, and the serverless takes care of the scaling up and down. Looking at the architecture of serverless, uh, we have separated decoupled storage and compute. We have also decoupled indexing and search. So your indexing happens on a separate set of nodes. That data gets stored in S3 and then your search happens from another set of nodes, and those can scale independently. And we've done a, f a few innovations in uh, serverless as well. Most recently, we launched the dev test collection, so the starting cost for serverless is even lower. So you can start with a minimum of uh, one OCU or, uh, for indexing and one OCU for search. We also announced the vector engine support in serverless. Vector, vector databases are becoming more and more common, and OpenSearch has had this capability for many years. With serverless support for vector engine, you can now do your RAG workflows without having to manage any infrastructure. You can just create a vector collection, start sending your vector data to OpenSearch serverless, and again, it scales up and down uh, with, with the new dev test collection. Your starting cost is also really low. So there's a bunch of innovation that's happened here, and uh, it would be great to try it out. So with all of these innovations, hopefully the, the life of someone who's managing open search has become easier. Ho we've done some innovations to help you reduce cost and operate your service at scale without having to worry about downtime. So if you were to look at the key summary of this talk, there are four things to think about. One, we have made it much easier to get data into open search. With our ingestion service, with the zero ETL capabilities that we have announced, you can easily get data into open search. With all the AI and ML capabilities uh, and the integrations that we have, you can do semantic search and hybrid search within open search and improve the relevance of your results. You can also do multimodal search. So a lot of innovation in the search space. Uh, we've also innovated a lot in the observability space. We now have zero ETL integration with S3 that lets you query your additional log data that you previously couldn't query. You can uh, leverage metrics and traces within open search. So in addition to logs, now you can have metrics and traces within open search. And we have the new observability assistant toolkit that you can leverage to ask natural language questions. And finally, we have done a lot of innovations in the service. These innovations are to reduce cost and help improve your operations with multi-AZ with standby. That gives you four nines of availability as well as the OR1 launch that helps you give higher throughput at 30% lower cost. And finally, all of the innovations in serverless that will help you not have to deal with any of the instance or sharding. So a lot of innovations across the board, and we're really excited about uh, y'all trying that out. Thank you, everyone. If y'all have uh, doing the analytics uh, superheroes, then uh, you're this is the QR code to scan, and thanks.